I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. Did you, uh, did you watch uh, Bird Box? I did. Well, I, I thought I told you about it. Did you tell me? No, I might have been the one who told you about it. I watched, I didn't know about it until I watched, um... It was a video, like a Bird Box challenge video from Cow Chop. And I went, oh, I should uh, watch that. Oh, that was so dumb. The Bird Box challenge videos are so dumb. They're they're really dumb. So how, how'd, you, how'd you feel about it? Because I, I have thoughts. I want to know what your thoughts are. Uh, perpetual anxiety. It's okay. So I, I thought it was a really good movie. My problem with it is, um, if anyone hasn't... hasn't um, seen bird box really good movie i call it like a, a horror suspense movie um not necessarily scary it's more suspensey um sandra bullock john malkovich they're fantastic in it my problem mm-hmm. with that movie is if it was an indie film i would say super fantastic movie but because it's a netflix film and netflix yeah. has money my problem is is it, it screams um low budget not in the quality of the movie, but if you think about it, there's only two actors with uh, m- multiple dialogues, and that's Sandra Bullock and John Malkovich. There's about mm-hmm. seven actors who have some dialogue, which are the other people in the house, yeah. and then and and that's everyone who talks. And there's only five yeah. locations where they filmed. There's the house, the supermarket, the street, the river, and the church. There's so they, the forest as well. I yeah, there's the forest. I was grouping the the river. But uh, okay. like th- there's there's so few actors and so few people with mo- uh, multiple dialogues uh, that I was like, oh, man, this is like if it was indie, it would have been the best fucking movie. But the whole time I was watching it, I was like, Netflix, why? I know what you're doing here. But that aside, well, Sa- Sa- all Sandy B and uh, John Malkovich were, were, were freaking great. Yeah, the part where the where Sandra Bullock went through the door and became John Malkovich was really weird, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's weird that that door ended up in the house that they just so happened to be in. Yeah. And John Malkovich just so happened to be there. Made for some really weird situations. Yeah. I, I will say the um, the part where she's running through the woods with the kids made me, made me chuckle a little bit. Because mm-hmm. my first thought is, because I've held, I've got cousins, and when they're younger... Like, I'd, I'd pick them up and walk around the house and stuff with them. And she's mm-hmm. running through the woods. And it's like, there's no... I, she's either super strong and agile, or those are dummies. And then she's running. And I was like, oh, those are dummies. And then there's a scene when she falls directly on top of them. <laughs> it's like, oh, man. Uh, <laughs> so once again, spoilers. Uh, I, it's That's not a spoiler. I guess not. I mean, see, I think in the trailer you see her running through the woods with a uh, blindfold true. on. The the only spoiler is that the kids eat shit. <laughs> You're not wrong. Yeah, uh, I thought it was cool. It was cool. I liked the the monster that your con because it made me like super curious to learn more about it. So the whole time you were like watching everybody and trying to figure out what are the rules that this thing exists by and and afflicts people. Mm-hmm. Oh, I just thought it was neat. I, I did kind of come across what the twist was going to be. The one twist was going to be, though, beforehand. But, oh, at the end? when? Um... Uh, no, not that twist. There's another twist, but I, I'm not going to talk about it too much because it's a huge spoiler. Yeah. Because it's like the it... secondary conflict that drives the entire movie. So. Oh, that twist! I yeah. got it. Yeah, I saw that. I didn't see it coming till a little bit before it happened, and then I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, but regardless, it, it's yeah. also a weird movie. It, it exists in a weird space for spoilers as well, because, like, the start of the movie pretty much is like, okay, this is what's going to happen. This is where it's going to end up. 
you're like 90 percent sure some like of most of the events but it's not about knowing the ending it's about the sheer anxiety yeah and i i will say that it, it was even though I, I i shit on it and i still like that's my big hang up is that it's clear that they were spending as little as they can and then they went hard into advertising to make as much as they can mm-hmm. that um it's about two hours of, of almost nothing but it was a super the, like you couldn't look away from how much nothing there was because they kept that nothing being entertaining yeah well also uh it is based off a book okay yeah it, it's based off i think like, what was it, 2012 book Typey, 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 typey. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2014, sorry. <laughs> this episode brought to you by Brown Switches. Uh, actually, mine are blue. Oh, I think mine are blue switches. Well, actually, no, they're not. They're, if I had they're the a, Razer uh... brand. My first keyboard was blue switch. This is like the Razer brand the, it, well, version of blue switches. I'm not going to lie. I'm not a huge fan of the Razer brand blue switches because, um, man... This this is not related to cryptids at all. No. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, talk about narrowing the scope. Let's talk about what switches are on the keys in your keyboard. The one I had Ooh. before this was the uh, the the orange switches, and I I wasn't a huge fan um, of those. Well, my my main problem with the my main problem with uh, the razor switches is they feel yeah. a little bit they're not heavy enough. If that makes gotcha. sense. Yeah. Um I have a DOS keyboard uh which I've owned for Jesus must be like oh 2012. So I've had it for s- many years. Oh man. I right I on. bet you there's more dead skin cells in this keyboard than yeah. uh I'll say the um cuz my my previous Razer keyboard I I wasn't a huge fan of the switches. Bad things happened to it so I got a new one. And I will say that whatever these switches are I've had them for maybe how long have it seven seven or eight years this one Mm -hmm. um i like them they're light switches but how they're constructed it feels as if when you press the key there's not a literal detent but it's clear that the amount of force required to actuate the switch changes about halfway through to Mm -hmm. sort of simulate like there is a detent that you're pressing and i like the loud clickety clacks I love loud clickety clacks. If anybody's listening, going, man, these guys type loud. We we like loud clickety clacks. That's fair. Yeah. It's also my job to type a yeah. lot, so you got to enjoy what you do. That, and I'm so used to to the 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 hearing the keyboard that at work because I'm using whatever they gave you know whatever work gives you keyboard, which is mm-hmm. like a membrane sort of cheapo keyboard. Yep. They. Uh, I find that my thing, I'm more like, instead of typing, like, it's like each finger is trying to punch the key to get that sound. So people are like, that's not even real typing. What are you doing? Why is it so loud? <laughs> All right. So since we've now spent uh, 10 minutes not talking about cryptids, let's talk about cryptids. Okay. Yeah, this is good. Welcome to Doctor of Brain Show, the quiz competition where the proteins in each competitor's brain are slowly unfolded and refolded. Some would call it a prion disease, but our corporate overlords call it competition. Whoever answers the most questions before the disease causes them to become aggressive and disembowel the competition advances to round two, where they and two other individuals are placed in a ring of death with six cats. The winner is gold given a golden Rhinox statue, and the losers will be turned into Cryptopedia's new brand of Bigfoot kibble. I'm Brandon. I'm John, and I'm not gonna. I'm not taking any more Rhinox bait. There's. Listen, this was a response to a comment that Clay Sinclair left on the Patreon page, talking <sighs> about uh, he's he brought up more of this got this Dinobot crap, but I'm gonna drop it. Because I'm a Good. cool dude. Yeah, I mean, cool we could have we could have yeah. not talked about it at all, and that would have been fine too. But you know, <sighs> all right. So what's what's the cryptid <laughs> this week? I, I'm I'm so done with this Dinobot, uh, <laughs> this Dinobot <laughs> lore that we've created. Our creature this week has been recorded as far back as 1338. It resides in Indonesia. It is humanoid in appearance and is still seen today. 
Do you have any guesses on what it could be? We've got Indonesia, 1338, humanoid, still seen. Oh, shoot. I actually might know what this is. Oh, yeah? Is it some kind of like... Um, it's probably some kind of like weird quasi vampire zombie thing, but no. I can't remember the name of it. It's not no? a quasi vampire zombie thing. Indonesia does have lots of uh, cool cryptids and folklore, but our creature this week is the Orang Pendek. And oh, the Orange Man. The yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm okay. moving this to the. I... I legitimately Broadcasted think this is... folder. You'll see was... it as a file called Littlefoot if you look for it. I think this was actually something that I was thinking of doing. It wasn't on the it wasn't on the sheet. I checked because no. there's another one where I went, oh, John's got that one tagged on the sheet. So I got this one. It's uh, Littlefoot in the Broadcasted folder. I just moved it over. Okay. Now is that Littlefoot like Littlefoot from those uh them there, them there land before time? No, oh, no, no, no. <clears throat> I am thinking about doing as like a te- if I have a shorter um, episode. Don't Google it. I saw you highlight it. If you uh, if I have one where I don't quite hit the number of pages I, I want, I want to talk about the um, the Brontosaurus and Brachiosaurus uh, thing and the fossil wars in that. Yeah, I mean, that's not even a cryptid. That's just it's not bad a... science. Yeah, exactly. I tack it on the end because it's something I find super interesting, but not yeah. necessarily relevant. All um, right. So, so, our... so take me take me on a journey. Yes. So the Orang Pendek lives in Indonesia, a country of over two hundred and sixty-one million people, and made up of over seventeen thousand islands. It's home to hundreds of ethnic groups who speak a variety of languages. It is not surprising. That given the vast culture and the sheer size of Indonesia, it's the seventh largest country, that there are settings of some unknown creatures. Is that seventh largest Mm. country in terms of, like, number of distinct individuals, or probably not landmass, right? That's a combination of individuals and area of which it takes up. So, but not if you take only landmass, because of it, it's all islands, really. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's it's not necessarily that large, but if you include the uh, the water area around that cluster, then it's it's rather large. Okay, I just wanted to know from the perspective of just so I have a context for that seventh largest thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the Orang Pendek is described as two point five to five feet tall. It's hairy and humanoid in appearance, and its name translates to small person. So, how many toe knives does it have? (laughs) Somebody scrolled down. (laughs) It did, but that also... There's also a very specific (laughs) creature, cryptid, uh, Lorax that pops into my head. Um, That's not... The Lorax is a... If you're thinking Lorax, you're probably not that far off from from its description. mm -hmm. The best description comes from cryptozoologist... Debbie Martyr, who describes it as usually no more than 85 to 90 centimeters in height, although occasionally as large as 1 meter and 20 centimeters. The body is covered in a coat of dark gray or black flecked hair with some gray, but the sheer physical power of the Orang Pendek uh, that most impresses the uh, Karen C. villagers. They speak in awe of its broad shoulders, huge chest, and upper abdomen, and the powerful arms. The animal is so strong, the villagers would whisper it can uproot a small tree and even break rattan vines. The legs... So, yeah. Um, so far, the description that you're giving me uh, reminds me of an orangutan. It's, it does sound a lot like an orangutan. Like... <laughs> Not gonna lie, the only yeah. thing that's different is the the color of its fur. Gotcha. It's, it's the only thing that's standing out to me. Mm-hmm. And it's a little shorter. Yeah. So I will comment on your orangutan comment uh, mm-hmm. in a little, well, really shortly. Okay. After Continue. Debbie's description, the legs, in comparison, are short and slim. The feet are neat and small. Usually, 
turned out at an angle of up to 45 degrees. The head slopes back to a distinct crest, similar to the gorilla, but there appears to be a bony ridge above the eyes. But the mouth is small and neat. She likes saying neat a lot. Um, it's just something I noticed when reading this. Well, you know, she, she uh, that's her favorite way to take her whiskey. Yeah, mine too, Debbie. Good on you. The eyes are set wide apart and the nose is distinctly humanoid. When frightened, the animal exposes its teeth, revealing broadly bro- uh, <clears throat> sorry, revealing oddly broad incisors and prominent long canine teeth. Okay. I mean, so it is kind of like a vampire then. So I no, it's not a blood sucker. It doesn't uh, or uh, energy because there are energy vampires. So, uh... Uh, there's no proof that it's not an energy vampire. Um... Touché. Because I'm... Touché. Yeah, I mean, like, how do you prove that? You can't. You have to prove it. (laughs) I'm not the one making the... I'm the one making the claim, but you know what? I'm just... I'm just putting thoughts out there into the... Into the universe. You're the one who has to make sure they're actually real. Uh, mm-hmm. That's how Actually, it works. No, that's that's flawless logic. I I, I can't. Uh, that's that's completely how it works. I can't argue with that. Literally, so, I can't argue with that. You're not wrong, <laughs> Debbie. Um, yeah. So in the because because of the picture in this this particular document, uh-huh. uh huh. Was the first time that the orang pendak was found? Was he? Did it emerge naked from a? Uh, from a couch, a, uh, a leather couch. <laughs> is that how orang pendex are born? They that, just kind of yeah. like ah, 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 ah yeah. <laughs> well, you know the they world, say, Indonesia, lots of couches. Orang pendek lives in the couch. Okay, all right. I, uh, I mean, just so as long as we get the the facts right. Fa- always, always the facts. I try my best. We we try our best to get the facts right, mm-hmm. but then also make broad statements. Um. Debbie, by the way, runs orangpendic.org and has been out in Indonesia looking for the Orang Pendic for 15 years, tracking it and studying its environment, setting up camera traps, uh, and speaking with locals and finding footprints. So, I, I as you were talking, I looked up orangutans and where they're, they're from, because yeah. I was pretty sure they live in, in parts of Indonesia, and they do. Mm-hmm. Um, are we... I, I'm like... Occam's razor is really telling me that this is an orangutan that's misidentified. It's possible. Like, I, 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 I mean, there's always the excuse, like, oh, they live there, they know what it is. Honestly, there's there's species that are endemic to our region that if you mm-hmm. showed me one, I would have no idea what it was. Yeah, and we don't have primates. Yeah, I mean we have wood spiders and those are those are actual demons. Well, yeah. And we've got the brown recluse, so that's that's fun. Yeah. I think yeah, we got recluses. I saw Black Widow once. Twice. Here? Yeah. Really? Or it was I just thought they were a little to... It may have also just been a little black spider with like a red blotch on its belly. Mm-hmm. But I saw little black spiders with red blotches on their belly a couple times. I assumed that this is a while back, but I assumed it was a, a black widow. But I, th- I, I don't know a lot from... about spiders outside of that they are demons. That's fair. Well, that's yeah. not actually no, that's not fair at all. Spiders are great. I'd rather have spiders in my house than flies. I'm against anything with less than two legs and more than four legs. What about a spider with that's been badly mutilated and? Uh... Is just a spider bro. He's got three legs. He's got an eye patch. <laughs> He's got three legs. He's got three legs. <laughs> He's got seven eye patches. Um, <laughs> this is an adorable accident victim that you're describing. Uh, he wears he wears a like uh, one of those those army green uh, jackets that was made for a spider. Yeah. But all the limbs that no longer work so good have yeah. like they're like pinned on. So yeah. he's got like uh it, it's it's kinda like whether a horse wears pants like this or this kind of thing. I'm not oh, I sure gotcha. exactly what that looks like. But uh <laughs> he also grumbles a lot. But he's a good guy and he'll help you if you need help. Oh, what a cool guy. But don't let him near alcohol. 
no, he's got a problem, he, and we're he's... we're working on oh. weaning him off of it. Yeah, it's a serious problem. I'm not making light of it. Uh, it's destroyed his life. Yeah. <laughs> Well, having seen it several times, it would appear that the excitement of this groundbreaking discovery caused Debbie to forget about her camera. So sadly, there are no images of this creature. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. So 15 years ago was what? Jeez, my, my sense of time is screwed up. 2004 now? Okay. Right? Right? Uh-huh. I think. Yeah, that works. Anywho. Uh, I had a digital camera in 2004 and I was a child. I remember, oh, geez, getting a digital camera, right? Because mm-hmm. this, nobody, like, cameras and phones are two different things at one point in time. And I, sure. I was like, holy cow, I have a digital camera. I'm going to mm-hmm. do so many cool things for my MySpace. I also had, like, <laughs> a... <laughs> Oh God! Don't remind me of MySpace. I oh. did some, I did some cringeworthy things. I don't even know. I I hope my MySpace has been burned off the existence of this planet. There was a video of me playing um, uh, a Rodrigo y Gabriela song in a coffee shop that I had on my MySpace, and I wanted to re-upload it to Facebook. Went back to check, and uh, Facebook did not retain um, right because that's before because now we're in HTML five, right? Um, mm-hmm. So they didn't retain anything from back then. There's like a handful. I like I recovered like a co- like there were five pictures that it carried over, but literally zero video is still around, and a lot of the pictures are also gone. Ah, oh, that's that's a that's a blessing. Yeah, sigh of relief. <laughs> uh, I don't think my MySpace is alive anymore, which gives me great joy mm-hmm. because <laughs> my MySpace. Uh, I would call it weebish. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was great. You could have the static background image or the image that would move as you scrolled down. You could have it just blast, in my case, uh, like death metal for people. Mm-hmm. I do remember they... that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, my problem was I had a lot of Naruto pictures on my MySpace. There were people at school at that period of time who would wear the Naruto headbands. Uh, just around. They'd just be wearing them around. I wore it once and then stopped. I think you wore it once to just be like, hey, I like Naruto and I got this cool thing from Naruto, so I want to show people. That's different from the people who would be like, this is my thing now. <laughs> Although I did do that thing where I wore a co- cowboy hat as Indiana Jones because I... High school's terrible. I mean, I have two cowboy hats, so I can't judge. <laughs> High school's terrible. I, I've got one in this room, actually. I have a cowboy hat. It's it was not... The, it's well, the same brand that, like, Rob Zombie on John 5 uh, wear, and it's like, I need a yard work hat, and John 5 and Rob Zombie are pretty cool, so I'll find what brand hat they wear. <laughs> <sighs> I mean, at least there's a reason for it. I was just wearing a cowboy hat because I thought it was a fedora. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff. Anyways, the O-Rank Pendex. I had a trilby at one point in time. That was a... That that was a... We don't talk about that time. Let's let's leave the the Dark Ages behind us. Yeah. The O-Rank Pendex. Like many humanoid-type cryptids, leave footprints. One casting measured about eight inches long. So I'm calling it the not-so-bigfoot, and then I changed the title later to Littlefoot because that uh, it makes more sense. Hmm. W- one notable feature is the occasional thumb toe. So, as opposed to a toe thumb. As which, opposed to uh, a toe thumb. Which, uh, what's her name had? Um, mm-hmm. Jesus, she ruined the Transformers movies for me. Wow. Oh, you said, okay, tangent. I might even edit this out because no one's going to get this. So I'm reading the um, the Rogues collection from George R. R. Martin. And yeah. um, and, uh, and because Pat Rothfuss wrote a thing from Name of the Wind, he wrote a side story on Bast and added it to that. 
Um, mm-hmm. But someone... <laughs> so in this book, got George R. R. Martin's name right on the front. Something mm-hmm. in the book didn't make a lot of sense. So they said that it made about as much sense as the Transformers movies. That's fair. Yeah, yeah. The locals uh, say, yeah. Oh, before we continue, uh, yes. let's just cut out everything. Uh, let's just cut out all of the stuff where I had that like really long pause. Let's just oh, cut yeah. that out. <laughs> the locals say that the footprints look like those of a small child. With that said, one candidate for something that could leave such tracks is the orangutan. However, they are extremely rare for the area. And specifically in this areas where Orang Pendek is said to be in uh, Indonesia, there are no orangutans. Okay, so that then in that case, my misidentification thing is a little bit less likely. No, there are a lot of well, other uh, monkeys in in the area that have they're you know they're all their feet are sort of similar, so you're not far off as far as footprints that a primate of some sort could leave. Okay, tracks Makes that sense. look like this just. Specifically, not necessarily the orangutan, but, you know, maybe there's a lot of them. Uh, Another more likely possibility is the world's smallest bear. The sun bear that lives in the area is a similar size and coloration to the orang pandek. Adult sun bears are just over four feet tall and weigh about 180 pounds. Whew. Those are some dense boys. They're dense, yeah. This picture reminds me of that scene from uh, it's oh uh, not it's always sunny. Uh, Don't hug me, I'm scared. No, oh, it does. <laughs> where they're like getting creative and they yeah. turn into the the humans in the zetai suits with the uh-huh. bits on them, and it looks like they're just doing that like like a dance <laughs> next to each other, and uh, it's making me more uncomfortable than it should. Yeah, uh, the picture that John's talking about. I added to the copy is of three sun bears, and I added specifically that picture to show that they they do stand uh, on two legs. They're they're they if they want to can be bipedal for at least a little bit. There's also a tagline on that. There's like a little little descriptor for it that Brandon wrote. Yeah. But I'm not gonna tell you about it uh, because that's a little gift for the, uh, <laughs> the Patreon supporters. Oh yeah. The eating habits of the Orang Pendic have been noted. Adam Davies and Andrew Sanderson were told by locals that they had seen it eating soft fruit in farmland at the edge of their village. The Center of Fortean Zoology had an expedition to Sumatra in which they found evidence of the Orang Pendic's food supply. They said in their uh, report that the following morning, we set out on a different trail. Several miles into the forest, Sahar noticed hair stuck to a tree trunk. It was a, about an inch or 2.5 centimeters long, dark gray, and was uh, a meter above the ground. We collected the hair for analysis, and close by Pahar, uh, plants had been stripped and their pith eaten. We found a stick with tooth marks on it, and the bite was about 10 centimeters across. So Not, none of none yeah. of that... Uh, breaks with my understanding of how bears work. Yeah. Just wanted to say. But anyhow, any, continue, continue. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you find seeds in bear scat all the time. Yeah. So, and it's... also they like to rub against trees. Uh, 3.3 feet is like shoulder height for them. Yeah. It's, there's <laughs> there's a lot of stuff right there that uh, could be doesn't... other things than yeah. the O-ring pendic. Yeah. Not far from here, Sahar indicated some damaged plants, known as pahar pith inside them. Sorry, pith inside the stem is a favorite food of the orang pendic. Okay, I don't know how they wait, know that. Wait. Yeah, I was they're, about to they're say. They're signing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there a type ses- Is there a type specimen of the orang pendic that I'd never heard of before? Is no. this a part of lore? <laughs> what is this? What? How do they know that it's its favorite plant? Its yeah. favorite food. You don't know. It's a reach. It's a reach. Uh, okay. A number of the plants seem to have been uh, dexterously peeled apart and pith eaten. A flattened area of moss on a nearby tree stump might have been the creature's seat whilst eating. 
We hid and waited in silence, but apart from the calls of birds and insects, nothing disturbed the stillness of the jungle. Surprising no one. Yes. <laughs> Except maybe the, like, all right. So when I was, like, 10, I had all these ideas for about, like, all these wild, crazy things that could happen. Yeah. Right? Because, um, like, you get in your head, oh, this this totally unlikely thing is totally possible because I'm a child and I don't understand how the world works. Yeah. As an adult, you're like, yeah, most of the day, unless you're actively doing something, is just filled yeah. with nothing. <laughs> yeah. No, 100%. Um, the following morning... We set out on a different trail. Several miles into the forest, Sahar noticed a hair stuck on the tree trunk. Did I already read this part? Yes, uh, you did. Ba -ba -da, ba -ba. Unless, unless, unless it's literally the same thing again. But it looks like it's an identical paragraph. Yeah, I, I, I might have. Yeah, no, it's the exact same paragraph. Well, uh, cool. So now there's <laughs> literally even less in this than i originally thought awesome yeah no there, there's less um eh, which is fine i'll touch on the cfc again and i do like the center 40 in zoology again we used their documentary um on the mongolian death worm uh episode because yeah. they I, are they're so, kind of similar to us where they want things to be real they go and look for them but they don't necessarily even though they're saying it's the favorite food of this creature if they don't find it they say we don't find it and they will also see something and then try to figure out what else it could be as long as it's creature related um, maybe they'll every once in a while say yeah Bigfoot likes strawberries or something like we just saw in, in here but I, I, you know, I generally like them sorry I got distracted by the, the document and the next bits of gem <laughs> <clears throat> it is at that point i found out that our old friend's destination truth had an episode on the orang pendek and i decided to give it a watch uh i feel gross already yeah well uh, well there's other parts that i that i added to i added context for claims they were making so if you're talking about the next image down, that's me doing science. Doing science? Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm not really. That's me copying and pasting. <laughs> okay. okay. They, and I quote, Load remarkably consistent eyewitness descriptions into our 3D creature-making software to come up with this digital interpretation of what we're looking for. I would like to point out that's not how re any modeling software works. Um, well, I imagine that's their code for interns. I mean, that is good code word for interns. So, for the because this is not a primarily visual medium, it looks like a Harry Danny DeVito. Yeah, literally it looks like a Harry Danny DeVito. Just imagine Danny DeVito from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia when he just has underwear on. Actually, no, when he literally when he crawls out of the couch. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine Danny DeVito from that scene. It's on the Christmas special episode if you haven't seen it. I think it's on Hulu now. Um, it looks like a slightly more muscular Danny DeVito covered in just a little more hair. Yeah. That, that's an apt description. Um, but, okay. So, uh, I like the idea of 3D creature making software. I do love that idea. So you can just I, type some shit in there and then it spits out a, a model. You know what the worst part is? I was, when we first started talking about this podcast, yeah. I was thinking of making a, like, doing some experiments with uh, Sports? Pr procedural sprite generation. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to do something where you could, like, pick, like, features for a cryptid and it would automatically generate that cryptid. I thought that would be very cool. Yeah, I, you might be thinking of Spore. Uh no. I'm, no, I'm distinctly not thinking of Spore. Okay, Spore, Spore is a distinct different, the distinctly different thing. Okay, but I was thinking more along the lines of something kind of like what Stardew Valley does. But it's, oh, not Stardew, I got gotcha. you. Not Stardew Valley. Uh, 
I, I, Starbound. Yeah, Starbound. I know what you're thinking of. Yeah, yeah sp- specifically sprite-based uh, stuff. Yeah. Anywho. Cool. Yeah. Upon landing in Indonesia, they ask locals if they believe in the Orang Pendek. They all appear to say yes and gesture towards a mountain. Then okay. they say... Several years ago, scientists on nearby Flores Island made a staggering discovery. Skeletal remains of an entirely new species of humans that lived only 10,000 years ago. Suddenly, teams of scientists are now taking the many Orang Pendex stories seriously. Now here, because I know exactly what they're talking about, I'd like to point out that what is really being referenced is the 2014 discovery of Homo floresiensis, nicknamed the Hobbit, who, 10,000 years uh, ago, lived alongside humans on Flores Island. Study of the bones revealed that they were more similar to early humans and apes than modern humans, and a distinct sister species to Homo habilis, and most scientists don't think that they have anything to do with the Orang Pendek, nor are they the missing link, because, again, they're more related to early humans than modern humans. So... Basically, on the tree of evolution, they were just slightly to the side. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, a thing that happens, evolutionarily speaking. Finches. Yeah, yeah. well, That's you know, literally... the thing about trees is they branch out. It's crazy. I know it's crazy, but yeah. it, there's branches. This, this seems like the destination tree people have a critical problem that affects a lot of Americans because yeah. it's poorly handled in our school systems. Yeah. Um, it's called not understanding what evolution actually is. Yeah. So anywho, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's continue down this, this yeah. wonderful path. So destination truth, almost as if they were reading my copy as I wrote it, said skeptics who doubt that the scientific community are taking this story seriously should talk to alex schlegel a field researcher who has been stationed here for two years as part of a dedicated search for the orang pendek his employers are none other than national geographic i was definitely curious about his scientific opinion on the existence of the creature and that's when i wrote this following page because i would like to point out that NationalGeographic.com, at the time that this episode was shot, and since 2015, has been owned by the Fox Television Network. <clears throat> sorry, by the Fox Television Network, after being sold for 725 million dollars by the National Geographic Society. And in fact, uh, <laughs> in fact, the homepage of their website states. National Geographic has delivered incredible storytelling for 130 years. And that's it. Period. The words science, research, journalism, learning, photography, or photography, etc. Anything of the sort. Those do not appear anywhere on the homepage. And while Nat Geo still puts out fantastic magazines and shows that teach everyone about nature and show like a ton of things... That you can't see without ex- like serious expense. It's worth pointing out that any publicly traded company only exists to make the shareholders money. <laughs> Sorry, I just I, I, I didn't have those for that. It's just like yeah. it's so stupid. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, like Yeah. And this includes, you know, VAVE outsourcing, making money off uh, RMO like Apple and adding more curious and sensationalist material alongside bog standard uh, materials to pique but... viewer interest. And you have to remember that you know, Discovery Channel put out a full length documentary stating mermaids were real. Um, and this isn't well, to say they... that they don't do good work. Uh, Karen Santamaria of Skeptics Guide to the Universe does fantastic work on stuff working with. Um, National Geographic, but they're, you know, anytime you see some little red flags, check them out. But, okay, so this is like saying, um, yeah, so I work for a newspaper, and I have, you know, journalism credentials, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. You know, you can trust me. And then you ask, okay, what newspaper do you work for? National Enquirer? Yeah. (laughs) Hey, inquiring minds want to know. Yeah, 
and I, I don't want to like because they still do really good because they do hire people like Karen Santamaria, yeah. who is a neuroscientist and all this well, other stuff. But they're also are a hundred percent not above just cranking out bullshit. Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, it's not like it's not <laughs> like they're a hard research organization. They're an entertainment company. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't use entertainment companies as evidence of oh yeah, it's an entertainment company, therefore No, you don't do that. Yeah. Well, and there shouldn't. is also a separate National Geographic dot org, which is the better one. <laughs> the dot com. Uh, you know, they're they're the uh when the magazine and entertainment uh and all that was sold to, to Fox. <laughs> is the, yeah. Um Oh, and the National Geographic Expedition link on the Wikipedia source, because Wikipedia sourced National Geographic for some of this information, that doesn't go to National Geographic. That routes to oringpenic.org, which is cryptozoologist Debbie Martyr's website, who is an employee of National Geographic and claims that the Oring Pendic may be the missing link, which is discussed before, like Homo floresiensis, it is not the missing link. Are, are you serious? Like, why yeah. is this even a thing anymore? It's, there's no missing link. <laughs> there's no missing link. There's a very clear evolution of humans from uh, yeah. primate ancestors. Just uh -huh. because not every single step in the chain is there doesn't mean anything. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's a slow process. So if you look at a, a skeleton from a thousand, that, the two skeletons that are separated by a thousand years, there's going to be subtle differences. Yeah. Like uh, even yeah. even nowadays, <laughs> heights are different. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So yeah, that's a seven hundred and twenty-five million dollar circular reference on the Oring Pendic. <laughs> that's so dumb. Yeah. <laughs> like that's so dumb. Uh -huh. that, and it's like it's the dumbest thing to be. Like like it's the dumbest circular reference ever. Yeah. Because here's the thing. <laughs> if I go out onto the street and say, hey, have you ever heard of the Orang Pendant? I can guarantee that more more people than not will say, what's an Orang Pendant? Why should I care? Yeah. Like, it's. I know that it's not it, – the $725 million wasn't explicitly for that. But, mm -hmm. like, it's such a dumb thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. It's like <laughs> also why are they like like so I assume that she gets a, a salary, right? I assume oh, yeah. that people I mean, working she's on been this there are getting for salaries fifteen, 15 years. years and then since at least since twenty fifteen, I forget when um Orindic, orangpendic.org was formed as part of Net Geo, but they and again, um Destination Truth, uh, at Schlegel works with Debbie. They're in the same same organization, so they're being paid. Um, so basically, what you're yeah. telling me is the search for the Oring Pendic has cost uh, back of my back of my hand for one person around a million dollars. Yeah, well, I like, mean, like back back of the envelope, you know, for one person, fifteen years. That's probably somewhere around a million dollars, right? Like, Jeez, I don't know. So Indonesia, the cost of living is fairly low. Yeah, but okay, still, still. That's, so, so if we're if we're, I don't know what how much she's making, but uh, research jobs in Indonesia, I don't imagine pay a lot. So if we do fifteen times, I'm gonna say twenty five thousand dollars, which isn't a lot. Yeah, but okay. But, you could I, I live was, on. Oh no, that's a lot of money though. That's oh, that's that's a third 15, of a million dollars with yeah. three people out there looking for it. That that's a million dollars. Yeah. So like even just even just a basic research team is going to cost around a million dollars. Yeah. After fifteen years, that's a yeah. stupid amount of money to search for a primate that's never been photographed by the person who's been there for fifteen years. Yeah. Well, I. You also there's, have to there's... think that 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 they're making, they're making TV shows, and they're on like they're using this research to fund you know, to go to TV shows, which then they're selling for for more money than they're probably uh, spending. 
I know, but like I feel like there's better uses of currency yeah. than searching for a a cryptid that Oh yeah. And I, like, I will say um because I don't remember if I wrote this in the document or not, that uh Debbie is also there for uh conservation of big cats in Indonesia. Okay, well that's so she's a little saying, she's not, it's not a hundred percent Oring Pendek, but there's still like <laughs> you know, yeah, may, maybe focus a little bit more on the kitties. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't mind if she focused more on the kitties. Yeah. But the Oring Pendek just seems like like I know we're not done with this episode yet, but nope. like I feel like I'm pretty confident that not not I know this is a bias, but Sun Bear explains it pretty decently. Yeah. Just, yeah. just wanna just wanna say, like, you know, if you incidentally find the creature while you're doing like real work, cool. But there's no type specimen and there's a creature that lives in the region that if you take into account misidentification, is a pretty good fit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean same about the same size, similar looking footprints. <sighs> All, All right. you know, can be bipedal. So next. what dumb thing do they do next? Oh, John. Next destina- destination truth meets with the woman herself, Debbie Martyr, who claims to have seen the O-Ring Pendic three times. She also says she has seen tigers four times since 1994. This is an example of how rare the creatures were. Although I would like to point out that if you Google Sumatran tiger, you can get a ton of images. Whereas if I were to Google the according to Debbie 25% more rare Oring Pendic, I get zero images. So what you're telling me is the Oring Pendic by Occam's Razor probably doesn't exist. It's I'm telling you that there are no pictures of it, <laughs> even though it is not dissimilarly as rare, rare as the Sumatran tiger. <laughs> according according to one researcher, who is they? I mean, they're paid by National Geographic. <laughs> and I don't with, even have an answer. Yeah. And with that said, Destination Truth uh, buys a huge sack of durian fruit and heads out into the wilderness to find this monster. Mm, that smells good. Yeah. Surprisingly, though... They caught it. Uh, they got the Orient Pendic. New species, episode over. It turns out it's real. Okay, cool. That yeah. sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, all right. I, I guess, um, uh, let's see. I guess we got to go to the plugs then. Um, yeah. <laughs> let's see. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, as always, our website is cryptopediacast.com. Instagram's at cryptopediacast. Uh, you know. Oh. <laughs> You put the SoundCloud back in the show notes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, SoundCloud is... Oh. What really happened is they showed bad night vision and thermal camera uh, images, and they got nothing. They got nothing? They so got what nothing. was it, December? They... God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> in the early 1900s, Indonesia was actually a Dutch colony. If you travel to Indonesia today, you'll see Dutch influences everywhere, from the architecture to Indonesian language itself. A few settlers provided Westerners with their first introduction to the Orang Pendic, as they described several uh, first- and second-hand experiences with the animal. Among Um, the most famous of these witnesses was a man named Mr. Van Heerwarden. Uh, who, uh, while survey, surveying land in Sumatra in 1923, described his encounter. Uh, you missed a very important Dutch influence. What's that? Um, they, they, they just wear the, uh, the wooden clogs everywhere. They just clog everywhere. You know, and in a jungle, it's not ideal because the, the clogs get wet and then they kind of get, like, dry. They rot really quick. Yeah. Traction's so not great. The traction's not great. Um, it's, it's not ideal, but hey, it's for fashion. <laughs> oh. So, Mr. Van Heerwarden described his encounter as, I discovered a dark and hairy creature on a branch. The Sedapa was also hairy, 
uh, on the front of his body. The color there was a little lighter than on the back. The very dark hair on its head fell just below the shoulder blades or even almost to the waist. It had been standing. Its arms would reach above its knees. They were there. <clears throat> they were therefore long, but its legs seemed to me rather short. I did not see its feet, but I did see some toes which were shaped in a very normal manner. There uh, was nothing repulsive or ugly about its face, nor was it ape-like at all. So what you're telling me, um, it was Mantis Toboggan. It was Mantis Toboggy, yeah. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> uh, another man, Mr. Oostink, described another first-hand encounter with this strange animal. While walking through the forest, he saw what looked like a man sitting on a log facing away from him. I saw, he says, um, it had short cut hair, I thought, and I suddenly realized that his neck was oddly leathery and extremely filthy. That chap's got a dirty, wrinkled neck, I said to myself. His um, body... Yeah? So... What kind of accent was that supposed to be? Uh, that was Dutch. Yeah. Oh, I'm Dutch. I got the clogans. That chop's got a very dirty wrinkle neck. That's uh, Dutch. I feel very offended. No, I mean, it's accurate. I feel offended. <laughs> what are you talking about? I, You're not Dutch. I'm my My last name is Dutch. No, your last name is is Durngum. Okay, what is that? <laughs> what, what language? What 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 culture does Durngum come from? Durngum is the uh, Polish. Polish? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Because they've got the dense bones. I can't swim so good. <laughs> His can't body float. was large. <laughs> It's hard, hard. You know how hard it was for me to float when I was younger? Like a, oh, a I part of like a, a Boy Scout, uh when I was when I was younger, yeah. I had to like float on my back for like a hundred <laughs> feet and uh-huh. do like a swim. Yeah. That was so difficult for me because every time I tried to float, I just sunk. <laughs> I can't tell you that's because you've got dense bones. I You've do. got the opposite of hollow bones. I do have the opposite of hollow bones. I'll never fly. <laughs> no. Not again. Yeah, they charge you for two seats on an aircraft just because of how heavy your bones are. It's a problem. It's a serious problem. Yeah. <laughs> I said to myself, his body was as large as a medium-sized native's, and he had thick, square shoulders, not sloping at all. He seemed to be quite as... Oh, sorry, to be quite as tall as I. Then I saw that it was not a man. It was not an orangutan. I had seen one of these large apes a short time before. It was more like a monstrously large siamang, which I'm not sure what that is. But a siamang has long hair, and there has uh, was no doubt that it had short hair. But then who was phone? But then who was... <laughs> but who was phone? Oh, okay. Google says Simang is a type of gibbon. So there you go. Okay. Yeah. So then it was it was probably just a Simang that had had long hair. Oh, short hair. Right. Short. Yeah, they uh, yeah they already have short hair. So it's Simang. Yeah. So yeah. What? The, wait. What? Then why even bother writing this account? It was probably a Simang. Yeah. Well, you know what they say about the Dutch. A lot of things. Which which one do you want to talk about this time? Uh, nothing, because I'm not insensitive as you are, John. Today's sponsor is Tim's Foil Hats. They're watching you. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they can't hear your thoughts. They're controlling you. Your brain is just some mush sending electrical signals. Who says they can't use a transmitter to put a few more signals in there? Ever wonder how the gang stalkers always know where you are? Where you're gonna be? That's why I use 
Tim's foil hat, the only tin foil hat that has proven to keep electromagnetic signals out and keep your own brain signals in. Order within the week and you'll get two free hats with your order. Now back to the show. So, uh, O-ring Pendic sightings are going to go up again, I think. Are they? Mm -hmm. How so? Uh, they announced the ca uh, some of the cast for the new Jumanji movie that's coming out. Oh. And the O-ring Pendic is one of the, the cast members. Is it? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, Danny DeVito had a press conference in which he was oh, uh, one man. of the cast members. That's awesome. He has his own brand of uh, uh, liquor that, uh, that I, I want to try. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, I just haven't seen it around, but I, I keep an eye out for it. I think you have to order it, though. Uh, you have to use... Uh, is it is it brewed from, from Trollfoot? It, is that it's the name of it? No. <laughs> no, its name is Danny DeVito's Premium Lemoncello Original. Huh. Yeah. Man, I feel like every celebrity makes an alcohol at this point. It's, like, super in vogue. Yeah, Ron White makes uh, tequila. Of course he does. Uh, Conor McGregor does uh, Irish whiskey. Uh, Metallica has whiskey there. Yeah, I think that's just a new thing. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of feel like, though, it's the, I feel like most of it's just uh, basically a, a brewery or some distillery will have, like, um, oh, they're just extra bottlings. product. And they just, yeah. Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. Anywho. Yeah. <laughs> As I was looking at different sources on accounts from the Dutch settlers, I noticed something. The orangpendic.org section on the Dutch settlers was literally copy and pasted out of Wikipedia. So if you go to orangpendic.org and look at what? it. What? Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. What? They left, you know, in Wikipedia how if they cite a source, there's like a little number in brackets. Those little numbers and brackets are still there, but there's nothing that they go to. What? <laughs> oh, oh my gosh! Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you go to oringpendic.org, then click Oring Pendic. Um, that's uh, that's a copy and paste of Wikipedia there. What? So. so Money well spent, Fox. <laughs> also, this this website looks like it's straight out of the 90s, even though its copyright date is 2008. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they All they did was change the font from whatever Wikipedia has to, like, it, it, it like a typewriter-style font. Uh, I can tell you what it is. Give me a second. Continue. I'm, okay. uh, Courier New. Monospace. It's probably Monospace. Okay. Uh, if one was to search for o-ring pendic video you would find this and um there's a video there for you to watch you don't have to put your sound on because it's it's um people on dirt bikes so it's not really great audio this will be in the show notes yeah th this link is in the show notes yeah all right so it's a bunch of people just looking back it's the guy looking back and forth and back and forth and back and forth um there's like a weird okay so there is a weird like uh, watermark in the bottom left hand corner that keeps popping in and out and I'm very confused by that but okay yeah <laughs> uh, maybe they did like some kind of stabilization oh that's what it is they did a, they ran it through a stabilization algorithm yeah okay. so in the video <clears throat> what what is shown is a group of people on dirt bikes riding through the woods and a bipedal fight sorry bipedal figure appears in front of them and seemingly outruns them I thought this video was fake. At first, for a few reasons. One, the video, uh, as they ride, the screen has a minor glitch, and the figure just sort of appears on the screen. The video quality is also extremely poor and shaky. And when it runs into the brush, uh, it looks like it dis disappears into a clear vertical line. However, these can be attributed to the quality of the video. Luckily, someone stabilized and enhanced the video, and it turns out that it is a real person. In short pants, no shirt, carrying a stick, and wearing a mask. Which isn't weird. Uh, the stick and the mask are likely for tigers. People will frequently um, wear things and put eyes on the back of their heads. 
uh, when they're around large cats, and this keeps them from attacking you from behind, which is the preferred method of large cats for attacking. There's a really cool video that exists on the internet of a guy yeah. uh, turning his back to big cats, and every big cat, except the cheetah, because cheetahs yeah. are awesome, uh, will pounce you if you turn your back to it. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's why people wear, uh, put, will put, wear hats or masks so they can put something on the back of their head. So I didn't see anything in this video. I just want to point out. No, um, there's, a, just, there's, a, there's a little guy running away from the bikes. I literally just watched this entire video and I didn't see anything in it. You like, didn't see the, the guy running? No, I didn't see. Oh, there he is. Yeah, it's a dude. It's just a dude. <laughs> he blended in. It's just a person. Yeah. Like, there's nothing about that that makes me think it's anything other than a human being running. Yeah. Maybe that's why I didn't even think of it. <laughs> Maybe my brain just filtered it out because it didn't look yeah. like anything. So there's a second link, which you don't have to watch right now. This is the um, video um, that I found that broke it down. And it would appear that the video is not of Oaring Pendic, but some bikers startling a villager or tribesperson and then chasing him. I also discovered Bigfoot Tony, uh, my new YouTube hole to go down. He does breakdowns of cryptid videos, uh, almost like how Captain Dy Captain Dynamic does VFX breakdowns. Uh, it's Captain Disillusion. Uh, sorry, yeah, Captain Dis Captain Dynamic is the Rooster Teeth one. Yeah, I'm disappointed in you. Yeah, well, it's Captain D, but uh, it's almost how like Captain Disillusion does VFX breakdowns. Um, I also like that he did a video and pointed out that Bigfoot was a tree got negative comments, and then released a second video titled, Nope, It's Still a Tree. Uh, I've only seen a few videos so far, but I, I do highly recommend checking him out. I believe he does uh, professionally um, video work, and he does a lot of, uh, he does a lot of stuff, really good breakdown stabilizations and clarifies um, videos. He has a lot of videos. Yeah, they're, they're pretty prolific. good. He's prolific. He's yeah. prolific. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. man i will say this though the 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 thumbnails are so same like every thumbnail like looks nearly the same which is not his fault it's just all these videos look exactly the same yeah yeah uh, all right yeah i do like them like they're super cool videos uh, it's totally worth checking them out no, it looks um, good. I'll, I'll have to watch it later. Yeah, it's. I went down a hole. I, I went down a hole. He is. Uh, yeah. Listen, listen. You don't have to tell me about weird YouTube holes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm. Some days I just let the autoplay take me where it's going to take me. Yeah, that's. I did that. I did that last night in through this morning. So I started. I was. I was watching videos on how to make terrain for. Um, uh, like tabletop games because uh -huh. uh, I, I that's something i want to start i want to make some terrain because it turns out you can make really great stuff for cheaper than if you were to purchase it and then i started going yep. into like fan videos about people doing diorama terrain and then i watched like an hour of some guy doing dioramas and it was fantastic i got trees here see I got a little apple tree i got like a weeping willow that i'm working on oh, one of these cool. days i'll finish them yeah <laughs> <laughs> put them back in the drawer because Jira mm -hmm. likes to chew them. Yeah. Cats be chewing on things. All cats, I think, have a little bit of pica. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. I, so I think Jiro especially does, but that's a whole yeah. thing. So let's jump back to the center of 14 Zoology's expedition. In 2003, they went on an expedition. Let me fix that typo. I'm <laughs> fixing typos <laughs> in the copy as we go. On, on. Yeah. On, on expedition. Yeah. In 2003, they went on an expedition to find the Orang Pendic. After arriving in Singapore, they head to a bar on the island of Batam in Indonesia, where they find their first witness. Credit Stefan to them, though. Yeah. Credit to them. If you want to find anything that is supernatural, a place where people regularly get drunk is probably the best place to start. Oh, yeah. That's what's up. Stefano, a man in his 50s who claimed to have actually seen Oring Pendek, 
told us that in 1971, he had accompanied an Australian explorer called John Thompson into the jungles of uh, Carency Sablat National Park. He had seen a small human-like, he, sorry, he had seen small human-like primates with yellow hair, and in order to stop Thompson shooting them, he told the Australian that a curse would descend on anyone who killed the creatures. <laughs> That's one of the best ways to take care of uh, asshole hunters. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, what's that? I don't even know what those are called. Just don't shoot them. Why yeah. shouldn't I shoot them? <laughs> because you'll get cursed. Oh, I don't want to be cursed. I don't understand the, uh, the island ways. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> They then headed to Sumatra, where they met with Debbie Martyr. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's everywhere, man. According to the CFZ, she was uh, heading Tiger Con for... Oh, that word. She was heading Tiger Conservation and searching for the Oring Pendek in her free time. She then, at the time of their meeting, had just seen one of the creatures three months prior. Okay. Yep. Sure. Uh, and she said, "This is a uh, 2003. So yep. once again, you could have like a Fuji film camera with you. They had them disposable cameras. Polaroid still hasn't been discontinued the first time. Uh, I had one of those cameras. They're little in 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 uh, like wide. You take a picture. The mm -hmm. image itself was maybe three quarters of an inch to an inch uh, tall yep, by yep. an inch wide, but it spit it out on like a bracelet or something. Yep." I yeah. know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I probably have a few of them somewhere in my house of, like, things. Unless I threw them out. That's a distinct possibility. But, yeah, yeah no, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I had, those, I had so much fun with those. And that was, like, 90s, practically. So, yeah. she could have had one of those. Then she could have had a bracelet <laughs> of the Orin Pendax. <laughs> that would have been awesome. Yeah. That would have been pretty dope. I mean, the quality would have been crap, but it would have been cool. Also, the, mm -hmm. those uh, the quality of the film in those was so bad. Um, it was real bad that they did have a tendency to produce orbs. If that oh, makes any yeah. sense, like uh, basically what would happen is the ink would die, like basically die, and it would become yeah. white with yellow edges. So uh -huh. it kind of looked like there was a glow, an uh, object that was glowing from its own s source. And it made it yeah. look like orbs. If I had, if I knew where they were, I'd, I'd upload a picture of it to like Instagram or something. But uh, <laughs> it's just more evidence that orbs are not evidence. But yeah, in the jungle surrounding Gunyong Tuhu Tu Tuju Tu Gunyong Tuj Tu, do you want to give that another shot? Tu Shu Tu Tu Tu. I mean, no, I'm not going to give it a second pass. It's I just... mean, I pronounce it Tu Ju. Okay, in the in the jungle surrounding Gangyang Tuju, or Lake of the Seven Peaks, Yo, you could have just large... done that. Yeah, I could have just done that. <laughs> you could have just done that and just spared everyone the uh, the lack of pronunciation of a foreign language that Americans are very good at. Yeah, a large volcanic lake within the national park. She photocopied several maps for us and also spoke of a lost valley a couple days hike from the lake, despite the fact that it was shown on the map so, so it couldn't be lost. That's in their actual that's Wait. in their the actual write up from from um, It literally uh, says Freeman. so it couldn't be lost. Yeah, it literally They're throwing he, some serious shade. That's why I love the Center for Fortean Zoology. They're they're looking for cryptids, yes, but they're also saying like well, it's on a map, so how is it lost? How lost is it if it's been mapped? Yeah. Yeah, like, I, this is... I love them so I much. I love that. <laughs> that's so sassy. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's that's the level of copy that we write. And most of the time, that copy is only for... The only people who get to see that copy is people who donate $2 a month, I think, on yeah. Patreon. Um, and we don't, like, publicly publish that for all eyes to see. <laughs> the contours showed a wickedly steep-sided canyon you know the contours on the map of the of the lost canyon we just don't know what's down there she said 
a lost valley. It sounded perfect. Okay. They yeah. They then set out finding several tracks, as well as what they believe to be leftover plants from an Oring Pendex meal, as I mentioned earlier in the episode. So Their guy. I, I want to take a second. Yes. Wickedly steep uh, contours. Yeah. So what you're telling me is that the Lost Valley no one's ever been to. Someone drew topographical contours onto a map. Yeah. Um, also that the Oring Pendic, which is apparently seen outside of this Lost Valley, routinely mm. leaves a valley with extremely steep contours. Uh, because why? Well, because why not? Uh, well, Rules are made to be broken, John. Well, but the thing is, it's it's a wild animal, like, in theory. So, all right, here's here's what I'm going to say. If yeah. your house is at the bottom of a cliff, uh-huh. there's no way to get to that get up that cliff, right? Uh-huh. You, have, you have a 7-Eleven next to your house. Yes. There's a 7-Eleven at the top of the cliff. <clears throat> You're not going to climb the cliff to go to the, the 7-Eleven on the top of the cliff. What I'm trying to say is, why would the Oren Pendek leave unless there was, like, a food shortage reason? And then, why would it why would it limit its scope of where it lives to just a canyon that's difficult to get in and out of? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Like, I mean, I've like, got a quick check by my house, and I go to that place all the time. Not because I'm at the bottom of a cliff, but because it's just close. I mean, yeah, I... Ultimately, living creatures are lazy, and they'll take the path of least resistance whenever possible. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the point I'm driving at, and this uh, doesn't sound like a normal thing. No, no. Their guide, Sahar, brought up that he heard the Orang Pendek. A demonstration he did was described in the expedition write-up as a long, drawn-out moan. Okay. Yep. Uh, from uh-huh. there... I wrote the wrong there. Let me fake. Eh, 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 eh. There you go. Two dollars a month. You're welcome. From there, they press on to Sungi Kongying Village. One member had to return home uh, to the home of their previous host, who had apparently become very ill, meaning that the guy on the expedition got very sick and had to go uh, back to the house of their previous host. Uh, he was pale and shaking, and they had feared that he had malaria. Yeah, the witness who were they yeah oh yeah totally which i malaria, like you know, malaria is the real monster of this story oh yeah the witness they were going to meet did not show up sahar later tracked him down and as it would happen he was a poacher and got cold feet but according to the poacher he was checking traps and in one he found an upright humanoid ape uh, and when he went to jab it with a stick, it yanked, uh, the stick out of his hands and freed itself. Um, okay, guy from the Bosberg Sasquatch case. <laughs> Did he go to the Indonesia? Because that's what it sounds like. He moved yeah. to Indonesia and tried to pull the same crap. Yeah. They then returned to see John, the party member who had to turn back. John with no H, by the way. Luckily, yeah. uh, that's, he had- That's the worst way to spell John. Yeah. He had food poisoning, not malaria, so he got lucky on that one, and they turned in the hair samples that they had found for testing. Unfortunately, they were those of the Malayan tapir. So, I want to point out, um, even if it wasn't a tapir, if, if it came back with a false positive, the problem with hair samples is you have to have examples of creatures that match that. Yeah. And if the lab that you turn it into doesn't have a sample that it can be matched to, it will return back a, a negative, which doesn't yeah. mean that it's an unknown creature. It just mm-hmm. means that that lab didn't know what that hair sample was. Yeah, the other thing about hair sample testing is when you submit a sample to test, when they compare it to search for what it could be, it is not, this is a big misconception, it is not across all known uh, hair specimens it's across a pre-selected group of hair specimens meaning you're saying i'm looking for canine hair samples i'm looking for primate hair samples so when you watch a lot of the uh tv shows where they submit a hair sample and it comes back as it is from none known primate mm-hmm. that means it could have been a dog but because they weren't searching canine 
uh, hair samples, when they searched across the primate hair samples, all they got back was a, it's nothing that is currently known. Correct. So, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, it, it, hair samples mean nothing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the they, long and short of it. Yeah. Which is, and they do that on purpose a lot for a lot of the um, television shows that do that when they, it comes back and it goes, oh, well, this hair sample's from an unknown or no known uh, creature of this species. Well, that's, that's because it's it's literally not from there. It's a cat, a dog, a, a human. <laughs> like it's it's they're, they're intentionally placing it outside of the scope of their search. It, it's usually like credit to the Center for Freudian Zoology, but usually that's that's an extremely manipulative tactic. And oh yeah, don't don't fall for it because it is explicitly manipulative. Yeah. Well, the CFZ again, they. Don't go for sensationalism, which I, yeah. which if you watch their Mongolian deathworm doc, it's uh, I, I made jokes about it that there, that it wasn't inter- like there is outside of wanting to watch that, there's nothing to make it interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, which I which I heavily appreciate that they're not going out of their way to do that. They're they're doing actual research, even if they're saying that. You know, an unknown species ate this fruit, even though there's no evidence of anything unknown having, you know, in the area. Yep. Um, that, however, is the abridged version. I would highly recommend anyone who wants to read the full expedition report to do so. Uh, there are some super tasty parts in there about another cryptid. Um, there is a guide who kept, who, who, they got this other guide, right? They had one guide, got a second one. The second one kept leading them in circles and on unnecessarily paths to the extent that Richard Freeman of the CFC <laughs> who wrote the report started putting quotation marks around the word guide whenever he wrote it. Oh, man. <laughs> man, that's that's such, like, <laughs> pettiness. Yeah, like, it's a really good good write-up. I like it a lot. This and is phenomenally a, petty. There's a story where he he at one point leads them to an area where the leeches are so dense he described the ground as writhing and moving. Like that's how and so like they were just constantly sitting down and he said as soon as you'd pick all the leeches off yourself, there would be more on you. Well on the plus side, this is a uh eighteenth century doctor's dream. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you uh what do you got? You wanna wanna be bled? Alright, so go to the leech field. What? Uh-huh. The leech field. It's in the jungle. What do you mean the leech field? Not Trust to be me. mistaken with leech field if you yeah. have the septic tank. <laughs> yes. Go to the leech field. You want me to roll around in a septic tank? No, 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 no. The literal leech field, it's just around the block. Uh, if you pass by the durian tree, you've gone too far. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so it's almost. Oh, geez, calm down, John. With with all that energy, you're gonna start freaking out the listeners. I know. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so worked up. It's the loudest I've ever been on an episode. No, you haven't heard last episode. I actually might never hear last episode because I don't want to get angry again. <laughs> um, that's for just listen to the. Uh... To the tag I put at the end, the post credits. All right, jeez. Oh, so, I'm pretty sure. I mean, at the end of the day, jeez, <laughs> I am tired. So, at the end of the day, yeah, I feel like uh, misidentified primates and uh, sun bears probably can explain most of the sightings, and there's no evidence whatsoever to indicate that this is anything other than a known species that's being misinterpreted i I would say that yeah there's nothing pointing to an undiscovered species so far that i've um found uh including witness reports and footprints they all they all seem to describe known creatures i will say that your statement that they it is not a known primate is false because primate is a pokemon (laughs) Sometimes, sometimes John misspeaks, and sometimes the Pokemon version of something comes out of his mouth, and not the real version. <laughs> Be 
because <laughs> maybe John has played multiple days of his life, put multiple days of his life into playing Pokemon games. I just want to 100% smash so I can get back to Let's Go Pikachu. I hope you're not going to 100% the stickers because there's like well over a thousand. No, 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 just characters. Just okay. characters. Just just, yeah. uh, just play it and like... Well, I'm doing... What I, what my new strat, which has been working out, is I play adventure mode. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, I believe, over halfway through because I got to the other side of the light barrier. So I okay. play adventure mode. But every um, 15 to 30 minutes, I, I'll switch out. Um, I'll exit adventure mode because that's when you get the new the, the new challenger has appeared screen. That that was what I was gonna say to do. Yeah, so I'll collect the characters through adventure and then dip out of adventure to get the new challenger, then dip back into adventure. Fair enough. Yep. Man, we really put off doing the plugs for a while this time. Yeah. All right. Well, man, I'm so enthusiastic about plugging stuff. <laughs> uh. So as always, our website is uh, um, cryptopediacast dot com. I guess. Uh, Gee, <laughs> you gotta play. Our website's cryptopediacast dot com. Yeah, it's something like that. Our Instagram's cryptopediacast. Our Twitter's the same. Not gonna mention the SoundCloud because I talked about it earlier. Uh, if you want to email us, email us at cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast. Um, for the Patreon, we still got, we still got a jackalope and that's Clay Sinclair. And thank you, Clay. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Clay. I dislike your life choices, uh, particularly those of Dinobot. Um, but I'll I'll leave it at that. We got to stop tearing into the people who pay us money, Brandon. Man, I am growing a lot. <laughs> did, did you roof yourself? I think I might have. <laughs> um, we actually got someone who joined the Facebook group recently-ish. Uh, so that's cool. More people join the Facebook group. We can do more stuff through that. Uh, Is there? I've got a question for you. Can I post to the Facebook Facebook group without posting to everyone on Facebook? Because there's stuff I want to post, but I don't necessarily want everyone seeing all the cryptid videos i want to post you can change your like share settings i think i'll, I'll talk to okay. you about it off after this uh if you like the podcast rate review subscribe we get a lot of people listening on stitcher i found um if you can leave a review on stitcher that would help a lot because it might drive up our front page results on stitcher which would be great uh also uh cast box is pretty co- popular lately too um if you're listening on cast box be sure to re- leave a review and anywhere else for that matter uh itunes would be great but i think our our meat and potatoes seems to be on cast box and stitcher so far um if you've got any requests for monsters or stories feel free to send it in <laughs> oh my gosh i cannot <laughs> stop nothing this episode uh Man, this is the worst copy read I've ever done. Like the worst plug I've ever read. Um, if you have requests and stories, feel free to send them. We've already gotten a few. Uh, we got some on Patreon, but if you want to let us know, you don't have to be a patron for that. Uh, you can email us, as we said before. Um, additionally, I read creepypasta and cryptopasta occasionally. If you have anything you want me to read in an overly dramatic voice, just send it my way, and I'll, uh, if I post it to the Patreon and you tell me to, to read the thing, I'll send you the episode, if you're not a patron. Um, and you can find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at cryptobrandon. And I also have, uh, if you want to be a jackalope, $5 a month, a relationship advice show? Um, I, I would I, say more like, it's more like relationship it's assault. Yeah, <laughs> because you don't the, the advice you provide is borderline illegal sometimes yeah well the last one the I last think, one was definitely illegal definitely illegal 
I've got to uh, start looking at the uh, looking at stuff to do the next one. <laughs> we should probably put a disclaimer on the front of that one in retrospect, but eh. <laughs> um, as always, you can follow me on Instagram at u twenty fifty seven. Generally speaking, that's going to be mostly cat and toy pictures. Uh, on Twitter, you can follow me at JF Dunham. I just remembered I do have a web another website. Oh, do you? I do. Uh, it's John Dunham. Dot RTFD. Dot IO. That's my resume. Um, written <laughs> as a user guide for like software or uh, hardware. John Dunham <sighs> at RTFD.io. Yeah, like as in read the fucking docs. Oh, I, that shows up. <laughs> that's, I love that. That's fantastic. That's showing up as error 502. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah. Uh, it says host error, so browser working, cloud flare working, host error. Uh, well, maybe it's dead. Who knows? <laughs> um, man, I cannot make it through a read without yawning. I need to stand up. <laughs> this is the longest this is the longest plug section we've ever done and it's mostly me yawning. <laughs> uh you can email me john at cryptopediacast.com. All those emails and contacts are on the website underneath our pictures. Uh-huh. Um and to get to the Patreon, click on the picture of Bigfoot with the dollar sign next to his head. Yeah, he's got a dollar sign underneath his head. Cause he wants money. I think we're actually at the point where the podcast is hosting itself in terms of income, so that's cool. Oh, right on. Sweet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, our art was done by Tom Hill. You can find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com, and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm extremely tired, John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weirdly sleepy <laughs>